Good morning. Morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. For this press conference of ECA, I will um, be the host uh, this morning. I will um, facilitate the speakers and they will introduce themselves. I will um, uh, call them one by one. Um, and we will um, have several interventions. And afterwards, um, you can uh, ask uh, the questions um, related uh, to uh, what we have sent to you. Um, you have a press release package. If not, there is Tim Law, the head of ECA, uh, that is providing it to you. Okay. Um, I'm Matthias Katsch from Germany, uh, one of the founding members of ECA. We have been here 2019 um, in the same place. We have been here 2020 in the same place. And the message is the same because nothing fundamentally has changed. And uh, I can say that ECA ending drug abuse is an association of survivors from over 20 countries. Uh, we have come here with 70 survivors from all five continents, with people from New Zealand, from all over South America, from Africa, from North America, and from many places in Europe. We try to represent survivors, victims, who have been victimized by um, Catholic clergy in their culture or youth, and demand justice from the Catholic Church. We are doing this in our countries, as I'm doing it in uh, Germany with uh, our association, Ekiga Tisch. Others of us are um, human rights activists, have created uh, NGOs in their respective countries. So <coughs> we are getting stronger and bigger. We help each other, we support each other. If you have been here around in Rome the last days, you might have seen our um, efforts to demonstrate publicly uh, against the non-activity of the Catholic Church regarding um, justice for the victim survivors of child sexual abuse. So with this said, um, I would uh, like to introduce Peter Eisley from the United States. He is also a founding member of ECA, uh, has been fighting uh, in these cases and issues for many, many years, um, and uh, is one of the most biggest voices of ECA and of the movement of survivors um, in the world. So, Peter, please. Thank you, uh, yes. uh, My name is Peter Isley, I-S-E-L-Y. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of ECA, and I'm also uh, proud to be one of the founding members of SNAP, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. Both of these organizations were co-founded by Barbara Blank, and many of you know who she was and her witness and her the impact she has made on this issue, I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't be here if not for Barbara. So in remembrance of her, she would be so thrilled that we have gotten this far with this issue. Uh, for, all the, for all the supporters and survivors that have fought this <laughs> fight, and for those that are no longer with us, especially those survivors that have taken their lives, there is an extraordinarily high rate of suicide among clergy abuse survivors. <coughs> if we could just take a few seconds of silence uh, to remember them, to think about them, uh, knowing that their spirit is with us today.
every survivor, as the church would say, is a child of God. And all of us are children in this church. Today, the most important survivor, all important, but today is Diego from Argentina. His voice, his testimony, what you're going to hear from him, should go in this room directly to Pope Francis. The front line of this battle since Pope Francis was elected was the country he came from and the region he came from. You cannot say enough about the survivors and activists and human rights uh, lawyers and attorneys from Latin America. And you're going to be hearing from them in a few minutes. They have done an extraordinary job. They have walked with survivors and victims in that country and in that region. Because when Pope Francis became Pope, the center of the abuse issue was there. They have a special moral claim upon this papacy and Pope Francis that none of the rest of us have. Pope Francis has refused to meet with them. Deaf survivors, you know that story. Won't meet with them, won't talk with them. <coughs> what makes it so painful and difficult is that we have to talk and present things about Pope Francis that people don't want to hear. Conservatives hate him. He can dismiss them because it's coming from conservatives, their criticism. Liberals don't want to know about it. They don't want to know about this. This is the gap that Pope Francis is able to walk through his papacy and keep this abuse going. The conservative liberal divide, which is all you're going to hear about at the Synod, or it's set up that way, is a false division. It is a false line of division. The line of division is are you going to stop the abuse of children in the Catholic Church or aren't you? That's the only important line of division in this church and in this institution. And it has been for centuries. We've had the privilege here, some of us, to be able to come forward because history and culture changed enough to allow us to come forward and to be heard. I was raped and sexually assaulted by a priest when I was a youngster. I am totally confident, I completely believe that if that opportunity that we've had came a generation before me, I never would have been sexually assaulted. Every time we see a child leaving a church, even when we're being criticized by their parents and grandparents, that's perfectly fine with us because we know that child might never be harmed and raped by a Catholic priest because of what we're doing. And that's what keeps us going, because that's a secret blessing from them to us. Catholics tell us all the time, this has not made me lose my faith. I still have my faith. <clears throat> what I tell them is, it is great that you succeed where Christ has failed. Because on the cross, Christ lost his faith. And he lost his hope. But he did not lose his love. Make no mistake about it. This is a crisis of love in a religion that is supposed to be based on love. The, yeah, sorry. No, well, let me finish quickly. So the foundational change we're talking about here is canon law. We can't go anywhere unless we change what is wrong with canon law. We've had canon law experts on abuse that have now drafted what is proper legislation in canon law about the abuse of children and vulnerable adults. It's really simple. If you have been found to abuse a child or a vulnerable adult, adult and you're a priest or a cleric, 
you are going to be permanently removed from the priesthood. If you have covered up for abuse, you will be permanently removed from the priesthood. At the center of the old law is something that goes to the heart of what is perverse about this institution. Right now, if you are found to be guilty of abusing children and you're a priest, and, and it is decided that you're going to have to leave the priesthood, be laicized, and most of them are around the world, by the way. What is the crime that you have committed? According to canon law, what have you done? What is the crime? It's adultery. It's the violation of the Sixth Commandment. Adultery. So when Diego was being raped, and this person was being assaulted, and this seven-year-old was being abused, he or she was committing adultery with the priest. Consenting. You know, adultery takes consent from two people. And at the heart of this is the issue of consent. So our first thing here is to literally strike out that is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. So it will no longer be so absurd and perverse. Until you change that, you can't. Cardinal um, Paul Rich, who we had an encounter with and taped that encounter quite by accident about this issue. He's the head of the Senate. He's Pope Francis' man for the Senate. We <coughs> had an extraordinary, Sarah Pearson here from Becca, conversation with him. That conversation's on tape. We are happy to share that with you. We have the link available. We'll share it with you afterwards. Uh, and what this man said and how he has told the truth for once as to what's wrong with this institution, what's wrong with this system. He said that Pope Francis is not in charge. He can't do anything really about abuse because he takes orders from the curia. He's taking orders from someone else. Think about this. And this is being told to abuse survivors. He also said the only thing we can do is re slowly replace bishops. So in other words, if you're a victim in this diocese and you have a bad bishop, you just have to wait. Those children have to wait until there's another one. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, we met, mentioned the uh, missing zero tolerance policy of the Vatican, <coughs> and a team of lawyers of ECA has been working on a proposal how such a co global common law for the Catholic Church should be written and signed by the Pope to introduce real zero tolerance policy within the Church. So whenever a priest assaults a child, he shouldn't be removed from priesthood and the bishop covering it up should be removed from his responsibility um, as, a, uh, as a leader in the church. So I introduce uh, Sergio, um, one of the um, uh, leading uh, human rights lawyers in Argentina. He has been here in uh, 2020 with the case mentioned by Peter Eisley. Uh, the Provolo case, which links Argentina, Argentina and uh, Italy, and uh, is um, helping survivors in Argentina and beyond to get justice in court. So Sergio, Sergio, puedes por favor empezar a introducirnos um, the proposal of zero tolerance legislation in the country. Okay. Gracias. Hablo en español. And I will uh, translate afterwards. Entendimos inclusive que era importante hablar en español porque en castellano, porque la autoridad máxima que nos va a estar escuchando sabe que su lengua nativa es el castellano. Y esta fue una decisión de de ECA como grupo. It's um, important um, to speak today in Spanish because the supreme authority who should know about this uh, speaks Spanish uh, in the Latin American version um, as his native language. 
En primer lugar, bueno, muchas gracias por el lugar que, que me toca aquí ocupar, a todos. Eh, lo hago hoy como representante del directorio de ECA, pero principalmente desde el activismo y como abogado. Yo soy abogado penalista, me dedico, tengo especialidad en derechos humanos, pero fuertemente mi línea, mi mirada es penalista. Y, y esa es una diferencia que quiero aclarar. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm here um, also as a board member of ECA, uh, but in my uh, first um, uh, specialty, my profession is a lawyer in court. And uh, I think this is very important uh, to have in account. ¿Por qué considero que es importante? Porque la mirada que queremos dar o que hemos dado ya lo en el sentido personal, es que no es el tribunal eclesiástico el que me va a dar la respuesta, sino que el que va a dar la respuesta es lo que se conoce en el mundo como el tribunal civil, es decir, el Estado de Derecho en su expresión de lo que hemos sido todos como ciudadanos, sin importar nacionalidades, ni colores de piel, ni religiones, ni instituciones. And why it is important that I'm a lawyer in court? Because the church law will not help us in this crisis. Um, we will only get our answers um, in the civil courts uh, of this world, and uh, there we have to fight. Por eso, cuando, como dijo recién Matías y también Peter, vine con, con mi amigo y socio, que hoy no vino, pero que es Lucas de Tour, representamos el caso de personas sordas y pudimos mostrar como habíamos logrado en cortes penales la pena de prisión para curas, para eh, monaguillos, para ayudantes de la iglesia. Y eso fue algo muy importante porque a la fecha, siete años después, todavía no existe el pronunciamiento eclesiástico. Sí existe la sentencia penal. So, when we came here, um, um, it was mentioned before, Uh, with my colleague Lucas uh, de Coeur, rep representing the case of the problem of ch uh, children uh, who had been abused in Argentina by Italian priests. Um, we were still waiting for the decision of the church instances of, ju uh, of justice um, for seven years. And uh, we had a decision finally in the in the civil court system of our country. Sorry. Por eso hoy me toca representar como argentino y como abogado y la idea como el equipo internacional eh, de grupos que pertenecemos a ECA, de abogados, es llevar el caso de Diego, Diego, Diego Pérez, eh, donde aún la Iglesia no se ha pronunciado en búsqueda de la respuesta, de la responsabilidad de quien fuera su abusador sexual, sino que además ha ocultado esa información. So that's why we decided uh, as a group of uh, uh, lawyers um, in charge of this case to take the case of Diego Pérez uh, to the ordinary courts because the legislation of the church was not able to come to a decision, they not in, uh, only have uh, uh, prevented justice in this case, they have tried to cover up uh, the whole case within the church. So we need to bring it to an uh, ordinary civil court. Por eso es importante que esta parte del encubrimiento no la diga yo, sino que la diga Diego en primera persona y cuente qué es lo que sintió y cómo vivió y vive en la actualidad el encubrimiento de la Iglesia Católica como institución. So that's why I think it's very important um, that Diego himself describe the cover-up he has been a uh, victim of and describe how it feels as a survivor when uh, those who have been responsible for your abuse are not uh, punished but the case is covered by the church authorities. Muchas gracias. Thank you. And now I uh, want to ask uh, Diego to tell us about his case. Diego, I will translate you. Bueno, agradecer también 
poder estar acá, a ECA, y bueno, llegar hasta acá, eh, todo el proceso eh, es muy difícil, ¿no? Aún actualmente, este, ver decisiones de la iglesia que está tomando de poner al frente a un encubridor, como fue en mi caso, y en varios casos de allá de Argentina, seguramente muchos, a una persona que no debería estar en este lugar. Este, decirle a Francisco que, que tome ese pedido de que ya lo pedí una vez y no me escucharon, este, es, resulta muy agradable. Um, it's very hard for a survivor um, coming here to Rome and see that the man responsible for the cover-up operation in my case and in probably many other cases uh, is not uh, suffering any consequences for his misdealing of uh, justice, uh, but he gets uh, promoted and gets a new uh, uh, office and a new responsibility. In the church. Eh, bueno, eh, contarles un poco también cómo fue eh, este, el tema de la denuncia, de, de, de haber denunciado al abusador que, es, que fue Eduardo Lorenzo, ¿no? digamos, este, llevó eh, una etapa de corto plazo por la investigación de, de, de la justicia, ¿no? que tampoco ha hecho mucho por, por investigar, con ayuda también de de la iglesia, ¿no? Encubrieron todo el caso, me costó 10 años nuevamente luchar de nuevo, empezar de nuevo con, con la lucha de justicia, ¿no? En el cual este, se ordena, se aclara y se, se ve que, que lo que se reclamaba era verdad, en lo cual eh, la agresión por parte de ellos fue siempre negativa. Este, cuando encontré la justicia o se vio la justicia por la orden de, de detención, el cura Lorenzo se suicida. Um, when I uh, started to um, publicly name my perpetrator, can you repeat the name? Eduardo Lorenzo. Eduardo Lorenzo. Um, a fight of 10 years started to hold him accountable for what he has done to me. I went to the uh, uh, criminal investigation system in my country, um, but um, I also went to the church, and the church helped to cover um, the case, and the in investigators came to nothing. It needed 10 years um, for to convince the um, prosecution office um, that he was um, effectively having uh, assaulted me and the uh, justice system uh, issued uh, an order of detention of my perpetrator. And then <coughs> he suicided, a suicide, a committed suicide. Uh, well, no. Después del proceso, obviamente, que quedé de nuevo otra vez el reclamo que se, que se hizo por la justicia, ¿no? Este, bueno, se hizo justicia, eh, ellos mismos tuvieron, ¿no? Juntando o tratando de incluir este, el caso y, bueno, me me siento con, con este momento que, que realmente a la actualidad eh, vuelven a golpear de nuevo las heridas del pasado, ¿no? porque este encubridor eh, no puede, como lo dije hoy, eh, llevar a cabo en frente eh, investigaciones de abuso en todo el mundo. Yo creo que no es correcto, no debería de serlo. ¿Cuál es nombrado? Eh, Víctor Fernández es el, fue el obispo de la ciudad de La Plata. Y ahora eh, Papa Francisco lo designó eh, a ese cargo de actividades para encontrar el abuso. And um, so there will be no justice in my case. 
but I still want justice to be done in the case of um, the man responsible for the cover-up operation. And this man was the Bishop of La Plata in Argentina, Victor Fernandez, who has been named by the Pope um, head of the global um, institution in the church responsible for all the um, cases of child sexual abuse by clerics. Bueno, y desde ya, por último, para no extenderme mucho en lo que he empezado el asunto, eh, bueno, que tome, que tome nota el Papa con este tema y que, que bueno, que mi pedido de haber llegado a la justicia sea eh, justicia para todos, ¿no? Porque a eso es lo que vine puntualmente a, a reclamar, ¿no? Porque, y bueno, desde ya agradecerle a todos ustedes eh, por, por, esta, por esta, estar acá y por dar la voz por, por muchas personas. I don't want to make many words. Um, I came here to ask the Pope that he understands what we are suffering and he acts um, accordingly. And uh, that's why I'm here and uh, thank you for listening to me. Yo voy a decir algo técnico para que quede bien claro lo que Diego dijo en primera persona. Él denunció en el año 2008 en el ámbito penal, en la justicia penal. Y no hubo nada hasta el 2019. Inclusive se llegó hasta archivar la causa. Y en el 2019, 11 años después, sacan la orden de arresto a este cura. En el medio hay cartas entre Víctor Fernández y el agresor, donde Víctor Fernández habla de la bondad del agresor. Um, just to add some legal information to the case to what uh, Diego Perez uh, said in first uh, person uh, to you. In 2008, uh, when he was a very young person, he started to um, talk about um, the abuse and uh, try to get justice by the justice system of his country. It took 11 years um, that uh, the court uh, issued an order of detention against the perpetrator. In the period in between, in this 10 years, Victor Fernandez, the Bishop of La Plata, has written several letters to uh, the perpetrator uh, in which he is t talking about the goodness of the perpetrator. Finalmente, y esto es hasta simbólicamente muy destructivo, dicho por él, por más que yo lo pueda sentir, tras el suicidio, Víctor Fernández hace una misa en su conmemoración del abusador en el lugar donde llevaban a cabo los abusos. And what is really odd, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it quits my words listening it. Um, Victor Fernandez, after the, um, the suicide of the perpetrator, makes the funerals for him in the very same place where the abuse took place. It's odd. Y de eso hay fotos. No es que alguien lo dijo. Hay fotos. There is a picture. There are pictures. Um, it's a, there is there is proof for this behavior, and uh, we, as uh, listening to the story, feel ashamed and, and uh, very angry. Um, how much more Diego uh, should feel inside when he observes the men responsible for the cover up, um, making the funerals. Um, and blessing uh, his perpetrator. Finalmente, nada más por mí, eh, el, el mensaje es basta de encubrimiento, que la ley de, de los estados esté por arriba de cualquier eh, forma de actuar por parte de la Iglesia y, por supuesto, darle pie a la doctora Alberto Méndez, que es especialista en, en Derecho Humano, que es la otra parte, pero... So, um, uh, to, to wrap this up, um, um, we make it clear, 
call to the church to end this cover up. And I uh, give the word to my colleague, um, Eka Ep member and lawyer, Alberto. Uh, Thank you very much. I will speak in, in Spanish as well because I'm, com I'm from, from, come from Latin America. Uh, so Matias will continue translating what I will say. Mi nombre es Sara Alberto Méndez. Soy miembro del, del board de, de ECA, del Consejo Directivo de ECA y abogado de derechos humanos en México, en el Centro Iberoamericano para el Fomento del Derecho Internacional y los Derechos Humanos. El 13 de diciembre de 2020, ECA logra un paso importante en el contexto de la justicia internacional y es la primera audiencia temática ante la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos donde se habla por primera vez en un órgano interamericano sobre el encubrimiento del abuso clerical. Um, sí. Okay. <risa> Yo te ayudo en, 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 en inglés. Sí. Lo digo en inglés. Uh, no escuché bien. Okay. Después lo voy a hacer. Okay. Eh, eh, I just want to say the introduction in English just to be clear for everyone. On December 3rd, 2020, eh, ECA eh, made a historic step on the human rights uh, fight eh, related with sexual uh, clergy abuse. Eh, specifically, we gave the first thematic hearing before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, where for the first time in the history of the Inter-American Commission, the eh, clergy abuse was discussed. In an, in an international organization, and specifically we address the covering up of the states, of Latin American states, specifically on sexual abuse. Eh, esto quiero manifestarlo de que eh, las cifras en materia de abuso clerical todavía no son lo suficientemente claras, pero cada vez se advierte la magnitud del problema. Y quiero compartir solamente algunas cifras para que se den cuenta de cómo necesitamos seguir trabajando en el tema. Oficialmente, oficialmente, se habla de poco más de 300.000 víctimas en el mundo. Pero, cuando se hace el análisis desagregado por país, voy a darles tres casos, la cifra es brutalmente mucho mayor. Sí. Ok. Um, I, to, to show you the uh, dimension of the problem, um, I want to uh, share some figures with you. It's difficult to have exact figures about uh, cases of child sexual abuse in the church, but there are some and I will try to highlight them. So when we talk in general for the world about 300,000 uh, more or less cases, which are publicly known, exactly, which are publicly known, then the, the hidden part of it, the dark part of it, which is underneath the, uh, uh, the table, is much, much more Voy a hacer tres comparativos. Francia descubrió más de 300.000 casos en la última investigación que se hizo en la, en, en la jurisdicción francesa. En México se habla de aproximadamente, oficialmente, de 500 denuncias, pero quizás el número real es más de 10.000 víctimas. Y en Suiza, simplemente la Iglesia Suiza ha reconocido 1.000 casos oficialmente, pudiéndose tratar alrededor de 10.000. Okay. So I will, I will share, uh, uh, compare three different countries. For France, a commission has established 300,000 cases of child sexual abuse um, throughout the decades. Um, in Mexico, um, officially there are only 500 cases recognized, um, but probably the real number is uh, going into the 10,000s. And for Switzerland, 1,000 cases are officially recognized. Eh, por lo que pueden ver, solamente en un país podemos encontrar el número total de casos oficialmente reconocidos. Es decir, la cifra es muchísimo mayor. Por eso es importante manifestar los casos más emblemáticos o algunos de los casos más emblemáticos con los que hemos podido tener contacto desde ECA para que se conozca la importancia de que esto llegue a la justicia internacional. So, as you can see, um, only in one country there has been highlighted the real dimension of the problem. Um, so, as ECA, what we want uh, to do is to go to show you um, the most emblematic, the most uh, the case with most significance 
uh, to understand the root of the problem and to bring it to uh, the international courts. Uno de los primeros casos que queremos eh, advertir es el caso de Canadá. En Canadá, eh, durante, desde, desde finales del siglo XIX, se establecieron distintas escuelas eh, para, para atender comunidades indígenas que eran administradas por la Iglesia Católica. En los últimos años se han descubierto poco más de 1.500 tumbas sin nombres de niños y niñas indígenas canadienses que al par que todo indica fueron abusados y fueron completamente eh, asesinados por miembros del clero. So to start with the case of Canada, where there had been uh, uh, schools for indigenous uh, children uh, for many decades, and in recent years they have discovered uh, more than 1,500 graves of uh, little children in the ground of these schools. Con nosotros nos ha acompañado Evelyn Korkmax, eh, ella ahorita está tomando un avión. Este problema ya fue reconocido por el Papa e incluso eh, manifestó una disculpa pública. Quiero mostrar la foto de nuestra colega Evelyn en compañía del de Papa Francisco el día que se hizo esta disculpa en Canadá. Sin embargo, no basta con una disculpa y quiero, quiero leer lo que dijo Evelyn en su última entrevista al respecto en esta noche. Um, We have our co uh, colleague and ECA member, uh, Evelyn, um, who has been uh, talking with the Pope. The Pope recognized these crimes as, um, uh, as real, um, but it, and, and he extended his apologies about it, uh, but apology is not enough. Evelyn, in his last interview with the Pope, said, I'm sorry it's not going to bring back the children that are buried in the Mark graves. Siguiente caso, Colombia. Colombia actualmente enfrenta quizás uno de los casos más importantes desde el ámbito local e internacional, que es el primer caso donde pudiera estarse señalando a la Iglesia Católica en un contexto de trata de personas. Um, Evelyn, by the way, uh, unfortunately cannot be with us today. Um, the second, but she sent her message to the Pope, uh, as Alberto has read to you. Uh, the second uh, country we want to highlight is Colombia. Um, Colombia perhaps is the first country in the world where we can show that the traffic of human beings, of children, um, was organized under the cover of the Catholic Church. In the Diocese of Villavicencio, a person was abused systematically for more than approximately 10 years and was trasladada en 36 iglesias diferentes y abusada por más de 38 sacerdotes en un periodo de 10 años. And uh, in one diocese, uh, the name is Villa Vicencio. Villa Vicencio, a victim has been uh, over a period of time of 10 years has been abused um, and transferred to 34 six, 36 different Um, uh, perpetrators, uh, so they could abuse him. Desafortunadamente, uh, este caso aún no tiene no tiene justicia y hoy hoy fue eh, liberado a la prensa eh, que el nuevo arzobispo de Bogotá, que ha sido nombrado cardenal eh, Luis José Rueda, fue parte de los descubrimientos de estos casos en Colombia. The case is still in the courts in Colombia, unfortunately. Um, but in recent days there had been news coming uh, in from Colombia that the Archbishop of Bogota, who on Saturday has been named Cardinal by the Pope, is involved in the cover-up of these crimes. Eh, con nosotros está Marcos Torres. Eh, él es un, un, un sobreviviente de un caso de abuso en Buenaventura, en Colombia, y es abogado de víctimas y abogado de derechos humanos en Colombia. Quien quiera saber más del caso y más detalles al respecto, Marcos nos está acompañando en esta causa desde ECA. Quiero um, uh, greet my friend Marcos Torres from Colombia. He is a lawyer as well and uh, also a survivor of abuse in uh, Buenaventura in Col uh, Colombia and he's fighting for the right of the children uh, who has been abused in um, uh, Colombia and he's familiar with the case. So if you want to have more information about these horrific crimes um, of 
uh, human trafficking of a child, um, he's uh, willing to answer your questions. But, uh, Finalmente, le cedo la palabra a mi compañero Francesco Zanardi, eh, presidente de la Red del Abuso de Italia y miembro fundador de ECA, para que nos explique la situación de Italia, el país donde estamos actualmente. Muchas gracias. And to finish, my last example will be Italy. So I give the word to my friend Francesco, um, who has been leading um, the fight here in Italy uh, with his association, and uh, he will explain us the situation um, regarding Italy. Buongiorno a tutti, ecco. In questi giorni un po' con i colleghi abbiamo discusso le varie situazioni, abbiamo colleghi di tutto il mondo e abbiamo visto come stanno andando le cose. L'Italia purtroppo è il paese, risulta il paese eh, con più problematiche, dove eh, la piaga della pedofilia clinicale è davvero un cancro. E ci sono tre motivi. Il primo motivo è la stampa italiana. La stampa italiana eh, sta producendo da circa 4 anni fake news. Fake news in questo senso non eh, purtroppo scrivono ciò che esce dal Vaticano, ma scorrettamente, deontologicamente in modo scorretto, non fanno mai, eh, non chiedono alle vittime se in realtà eh, quanto dice la Chiesa è vero. Non sentono, diciamo un contraddittorio delle vittime, questo deontologicamente è un gravissimo problema perché disinforma eh, anche i lettori. Il secondo problema è purtroppo la giustizia italiana. Qualche mese fa abbiamo inviato più di 400 casi alla Procura Generale della Repubblica in un report, report che poi è stato mandato anche sotto forma di denuncia sia alle Nazioni Unite sia al Parlamento europeo, dove è in corso attualmente una petizione. Ebbene, eh, in questo caso, che è stato abbastanza grave, anzi piuttosto grave, la Procura Generale della Repubblica, che ha l'obbligo di procedere d'ufficio, non ha neanche acquisito i nominativi, malgrado i solleciti, quindi cioè ha omesso di fare verifiche, pure eh, in Italia abbiamo poche leggi, ma questa esiste, c'è l'obbligo di procedura d'ufficio quando si tratta di minori e questo è stato omesso. Ora, ora eh, presentiamo quest'oggi, poi mh, chi lo vuole abbiamo il link, vi possiamo dare tramite il link il report che presentiamo in questa sede, abbiamo fatto un report separato da quello dello Stato italiano e eh, in questo si parla della conferenza episcopale italiana. Noi eh, abbiamo ha avuto diversi incontri con, direttamente con il presidente della CEI, il cardinale Matteo Zuppi, che eh, io non so chi di voi era alla prima conferenza stampa quando io intervenni di fronte a Zuppi, Zuppi mi disse ci vediamo e se avete dei nominativi portateceli. Benissimo, ci siamo visti, i nominativi non li ha voluti, cioè non c'è stata possibilità eh, di dare questi nominativi. Eh, parallelamente io parlo di Zuppi perché in realtà è il capo dei vescovi italiani, è il presidente della conferenza episcopale, purtroppo abbiamo decine di casi, e eh, qualcuno lo, li, lo documentiamo nel caso che poi eh, vi posso dare, dove anche i vescovi fanno la stessa cosa, anzi addirittura dietro segnalazione tu fai la segnalazione al vescovo, come è successo a noi nel caso di Imperia, del vescovo Suetta, Bene, lui ha risposto minacciando querela, cioè il vescovo, gli sportelli diocesani in Italia, se cerchi di dargli informazioni, spesso e volentieri ti intimidiscono, minacciando querela, questo succede, figuriamoci, la rete d'abuso non si spaventa di sicuro dietro la minaccia di querela del vescovo, anche perché non la farà, purtroppo eh, provate a mettervi un attimo eh, nei panni di una vittima, che va a denunciare in uno di questi sportelli diocesani e viene minacciato di querela. La situazione ecco, si va a unire gravemente con quella del governo italiano, cioè conferenza episcopale e governo, perché eh, un'altra omissione, un altro permesso che ha dato lo Stato italiano impunemente 
è quello eh, che, che durante la conferenza CEI la CEI ha chiaramente detto che non darà i nominativi dei primi pedofili alla magistratura cioè in pratica la magistratura ha lasciato facoltà alla conferenza episcopale di insabbiare i casi cioè di omettere le denunce, di omettere la giustizia alle vittime e via dicendo in questo report noi abbiamo trattato il report, questo qua della CEI, dove un centinaio di casi erano più che sufficienti, invece ne abbiamo trattati ben 322, eh, 32, eh, 332, vi dico il perché, perché in realtà sono molti di più, ma sono 332 casi che la rete d'abuso ha seguito, raccolto e documentato nei 13 anni di lavoro in Italia. Quindi erano, sono casi che ho seguito personalmente, casi di cui so cosa le affermazioni che ho fatto, negli altri casi spesso mancano, diciamo, gli altri casi italiani che non abbiia seguito, spesso manca la vittima, mancano dei riscontri, e c'è solo quello che ha scritto la stampa che purtroppo in Italia è totalmente inaffidabile. E, bene, in questi 300 e passa casi un dato che emerge davvero terrificante perché come vediamo in, in Francia, in Spagna, insomma in tutto il mondo eh, anche se non piacevolmente eh, le conferenze episcopali si sono messe in moto in Francia addirittura risarcendo le vittime, poco, ma di fatto c'è stata un'attività in Italia invece la conferenza episcopale è totalmente omissiva e abbiamo riscontrato nel 100% dei casi esaminati eh, che è stata omessa ovviamente la denuncia alle autorità civili nel 100%, nel 100 dei casi la Chiesa non ha mai reso giustizia neppure umana alla vittima. Nel 100% dei casi i sopravvissuti non hanno ottenuto neppure un soccorso, cioè eh, cure mediche, psicologiche, come era stato promesso. Di nuovo, nel 100% dei casi non c'è stato alcun indennizzo. Anzi, quando io parlai con il presidente della CEI, Matteo Zuppi, oltre a non volere i casi, e... Eh, eh, chiesi ma almeno di quella limitata fascia che volete analizzare che era quella dal 2000 al 2023 ci saranno risarcimenti e Zuppi mi ha detto no, per carità se iniziamo a risarcire le vittime poi vengono tutti a denunciare ecco questo è un po' diciamo io direi che è un fatto abbastanza grave perché di fatto la, la CEI sta facendo dossieraggio cioè sta acquisendo dalle vittime i nominativi dei preti pedofili per poi spostarli eccetera eccetera come vedrete nel report di otto pagine che adesso non mi dilungo a spiegare perché eh, poi ve lo, lo, legge, lo leggete di fatto eh, spostando quei preti, imboscando, insabbiando di fatto non facendo proprio nulla ecco, vi lascio perché il tempo a disposizione mi fanno segno che è, è poco prego uh, regarding the time I would uh, ask you to uh, uh, come to an end Grazie. <laughs> Why, why it's important for us uh, to give the, uh, uh, the space for uh, Francesco here because it's so difficult in Italy to talk about these issues. So when we are talking about the dimension of abuse, Italy uh, is the big, big dark hole where we wait uh, to, cover, to, 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 to come out um, of uh, the dimension of the problem. And uh, he and his association are fighting um, constantly uh, on this issue. Um, we have a, 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 another example here just to show you the diversity of ECHA and the diversity of the abuse within the Catholic Church. And I welcome um, um, Janet Aguti from uh, Uganda. Um, who will share about her fight as a human rights um, activist. Um, and similar to our friend uh, um, 
from Colombia. Uh, she is fighting her fight for justice because uh, she is a survivor of child sexual abuse as well as uh, many of us are. Janet. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. As he said, I'm Maguti Janet, an activist from Uganda. For us, it's more painful that the statistics are being mentioned here, but then in Africa, you might not find as much because of the fears that are attached and the societal norms that are attached to being, first of all, sexually abused, and now was to be a victim of clergy abuse. For us, the state works hand in hand with the church, and we benefit a lot from the church. So it makes it harder for the state to know how to navigate the situations when they come up, and the cover-ups are even worse in Africa. Because the priest, once there is any allegation of abuse, is then transferred to another African country or to the nearest diocese around, just to remove, the, the, to cover up the situation so that the entire generation doesn't get to know it. It becomes even harder for a victim to come up and say they've been abused by a clergy because of the benefits that we have. They have helped us to build schools, they have helped us to build hospitals, and you don't want to be the first to come up and point fingers at them because then the community is going to turn against you because you're closing the wells that they're benefiting from, the waters that we're drinking from. So, what amount of strength are we going to get as Africans to even report the case to the local police if this is happening worldwide? Our brains, our mindsets are still different and we really believe that priests can cause no harm. But the reality is, with the people that I've worked with, the cases that I've received in my organization, they do cause harm and it's even worse for the women and the children. My request is going directly to the poor. Once the zero tolerance law is signed, it is a stepping stone. It's the foundation of how to navigate the situations. You cannot start a journey if you don't know where you're starting from, if you don't have a starting line. And in my opinion, the zero tolerance law is the starting point to know how to navigate and end the cover-ups in the Catholic Church. Thank you very much. Janet, thank you so much. Uh, uh, well, sir, uh, I will have a short wrap-up uh, in Spanish for, for our friend. Um, the, la situación en, en uh, mi país es especialmente complicado porque um, a, la, a los sacerdotes se trata con respeto y muy difícil de uh, denunciarlos ante la policía y ante las cortes. Um, y la iglesia está tratando de ocultar todo eso. Um, los sacerdotes um, están interesados en mantener sus privilegios, también financieros, um, y, y su vida buena. Así que creemos que se necesita este, esta ley de cero tolerancia a nivel mundial para apoyar y ayudar um, de uh, la la, la clarificación de los casos de abuso en nuestro país y por eso yo eh, llamo al Papa de firmar esa ley and with this said uh, I want to um, uh, highlight the work of our, our lawyers which is included here in the package you have they have formulated um, a law a proposal of law to re-emplace uh, those articles Peter Eisley mentioned in the beginning and to put a real um, working um, instrument in the canon law of the church regarding child sexual abuse. Uh, these paragraphs um, could be signed uh, tomorrow by the Pope. They will work. And um, if um, 
the church has a better proposal, so they should come forward with it. But as it is, it cannot stay. So um, if you have any question regarding um, the proposal of law and the paragraphs, they are very simple, very clear. Um, you can ask uh, Sergio or Alberto, our experts in, uh, in civil uh, law and the court law, um, about the terms of this um, law of zero tolerance. And um, we started um, with Argentina. We heard about um, Canada, Colombia, Uganda, Italy. Um, it's almost the whole world um, which is part of this crisis. And the answer is here in the center of it, in the center of the global Catholic Church. That's why we come in here to Rome. Not because it's a wonderful city, it is, um, and we enjoy it. But we come here because we need to help accountable those in charge. And those in charge are the cardinals who are supporting the Pope, and one of the most important cardinals is the Cardinal Honoris at the moment in his role as relator um, of the um, beginning well, uh, World Synod of Bishops coming to Rome. And as Peter Eisley mentioned, um, they, we had uh, an encounter with uh, Cardinal Horroris. Uh, he can explain uh, more in detail in a, in a few minutes uh, about it. Um, and it's a very disturbing message which came out of this encounter. Um, by accident, as mentioned, this was filmed. Um, and you have a link in your documentation uh, where you could uh, check this film by yourself. We will not show it here because privacy laws in Europe would prevent us to do so. And we don't want to break the law. We want to enforce the law. That's why we put a law of zero tolerance on the table. But what our colleagues learned in this conversation is so important and so disturbing. Um, that's why we want them to tell us about this conversation. Okay. 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 Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Pearson, S-A-R-A-H-P-E-A-R-S-O-N. I'm a member of ETA, and I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the United States. And um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about this video that we have. Um, it, it brings me no pleasure to have to bring this video here today and, and talk about it, because this is as a serious conversation and one that really um, gets at the heart of what the problem is um, with this law in the Catholic Church and the fact that there is no zero tolerance. Um, okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about this encounter. Um, my colleague Peter Isley and I were on a Zoom call and um, we looked up and we happened to see the Cardinal, Cardinal Hollerich, and this was really important for us because we had written to him at the beginning of September. We had a survivor that we know um, delivered this zero tolerance legislation along with a letter from our organization asking the Cardinal um, in his position as Relator General the top leader of the Synod on Synodality, to make zero tolerance uh, the centerpiece of the Synod and to ex give this law to the Pope and express to him that it was survivors' desire to see this signed into law before the Synod. Okay. Um, para entender por qué es tan importante eh, esa, uh, esa conversación al lado que tuvimos con el uh, Cardenal Jorgelis, desde hace varios meses estamos tratando de uh, conectar con él porque él tiene este importante rol en, la, en el sínodo uh, y le presentamos la, law, uh, la, la ley de cero tolerancia que hemos 
um, que hemos hecho para que lo pase al Papa, para que el Papa uh, decida si quiere firmar este, uh, esta, no, esta ley. Y hemos uh, tratado de, de conectar con el cardenal uh, a través de un sobreviviente de abuso sexual uh, que tiene relación con él y um, por varios meses hemos tratado de, um, uh, de conectar y ahora de un momento al otro nos encontramos con él uh, aquí en Roma, en la calle, en el momento que estamos uh, haciendo una uh, conversación por video. We had hoped that we would hear back from our letter from the Cardinal, and we had not. So my colleague Peter Isley and I were on a Zoom call, and yeah, yeah, okay. The Cardinal had promised to deliver this letter to the Pope on a meeting um, on September 18th. And he told our friend who is a survivor of crazy sexual abuse that he would ask the Pope to read it, digest it, and to take it seriously. So, um, el Cardenal había prometido a nuestro amigo sobreviviente que le había entregado uh, nuestro papel, nuestra ley, que iba a pasarlo al Papa directamente. Lo había prometido en una conversación en septiembre. This is, not, this is not what happened. Um, so we were on a Zoom call. We were sitting in the street at a cafe and we looked up and there he was, Cardinal Hollerich. So we had to go over to him and we had to start a conversation. So in this conversation, there were several admissions he made that disturbed us as to the processes, the uh, practices in the Vatican surrounding zero tolerance, and I can detail a few of them for you today. So, estábamos sentados en la calle aquí en Roma uh, haciendo un, un, una conferencia por video, um, y en este momento pasa el cardenal Hollerich que habíamos tratado de encontrarnos con él uh, durante varios meses. Así que tuvimos que pararnos y conversar con él, porque era una oportunidad única. Y durante esa conversación, él hizo algunas um, um, explicaciones sobre lo que pasa en el Vaticano uh, con respecto a este tema y con respecto al sínodo uh, que uh, realmente uh, nos uh, causan uh, dolores de cabeza y uh, quiero presentarles algunos de estos uh, First, we expressed in this conversation the urgency of the zero tolerance law. Um, it's now been 30 years or so that this abuse catastrophe has been publicly well known. And it does not seem like there's an end in sight unless this law is passed. So we asked him, firstly, he said, that he would give the law to the Pope in December, and we said this was not good enough. It needed to happen before the Synod because the abuse is ongoing. So, in, in un comienzo hablamos de la urgencia uh, que esa legislación sobre la cero tolerancia sea promulgada uh, por el Papa, porque la crisis uh, no es del pasado. Niños hoy en día todavía siguen ser acusados uh, y se necesita um, actuar ahora y no esperar y el cardenal dijo que iba a pasar la, let la letra al papa en diciembre y nosotros le dijimos no, no se puede esperar uh, otros meses más hay que actuar ahora We asked please, Cardinal, will you give this to the Pope now before the Synod and he told us he left his copy in Luxembourg so we urged him, uh, 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 le pedimos con urgencia, por favor, pásale la, la letra al Papa para que lo lea. Y él dijo, mira, uh, me, me olvidé uh, la copia en Luxemburgo, con la traje de Roma. There were other things he said, such as, 
that the solution zero tolerance, the reason zero tolerance could not be implemented is because he needed to, the Pope needed to replace the United States bishops slowly over time in order to do this. Y entonces, después eh, empezó a, a explicar del por qué cero tolerancia en la iglesia no iba a funcionar por el momento. Porque para eso habría que emplazar, reemplazar a los obispos uno por uno. Porque todos habían fallado en el pasado. Y así que eso es un proceso largo y eso es se hace con, con tiempo, no se, no se puede reemplazar todos los uh, obispos al mismo momento, hay que hacerlo de uno a uno. He told us that the curia tells the Pope what to do, um, and that he could not do this on his own. Así que, uh, si el Papa quisiera firmar una legislación así de cero tolerancia, uh, probablemente no pueda hacerlo. Porque es la curia que le dice al Papa qué hacer. Él no puede decidir eso. And finally, again, as we implored him and told him, you know, as your role, in your role as Relator General, as the top person in the Senate, that he has a responsibility and a, and a duty he was chosen, and he needs to be an advocate for survivors. At the Senate, um, he told us that if he were to do this, he would be shot. And we asked him for clarification, saying, shot? And he said, by the conservative bishops. Así que, uh, otra vez le pedimos, por favor, entrega la letra y toma la responsabilidad que, que, que usted, el Papa, le ha dado uh, como relator del sínodo uh, para adelantar este, eh, estos casos de, de abuso sexual eh, de clericales eh, y hacerlo un, un, uh, un, un punto de, de, de debate en el sínodo y él dijo mira si hago eso me matan a balazo y ellos preguntan pero quién quién lo va a matar uh, los obispos conservadores fue la respuesta now you have to understand this was a devastating conversation to those of us um, who were advocating for the zero tolerance law to be passed. Um, like I said before, this is not something we take joy in having to share this. It's a, it's a burden to be a witness and a part of a conversation like this. Eso fue una, uh, uh, nos dejó muy deprimido esa conversación porque sentimos como um, una, uh, una carga encima um, que um, tenemos una responsabilidad de hacer algo uh, en favor de los niños y niñas y aparentemente eso es muy difícil de, uh, de que se llegue a hacer. And the reason we shared this link to this video for you to see it for yourselves is because we feel it's imperative that people know um, how the top leaders of the Vatican are discussing this issue and handling it between them. Y la, la razón por la cual uh, compartimos eh, esa conversación con ustedes y les demos la oportunidad uh, de ver el video por sí mismo ustedes por sí mismos como periodistas uh, porque creemos uh, que, creemos que es importante que el mundo sepa cómo los más altos funcionarios de la iglesia católica internamente piensan sobre este asunto finally I want to add we heard during this conversation um, because <coughs> Because the Cardinal left his copy of the law in Luxembourg, we asked if we could print out another one and bring it to him. So he told us to bring it to the Jesuit Curia. So we went there Friday night um, with another copy of the Zero Tolerance Law and a letter to him asking for clarification on the things he had said, um, as, as well as we actually invited him to this press conference today. Um, we had asked for his support for the zero tolerance law, and we wanted him to be here today to say that this is something he would support and introduce at the beginning of the Senate. 
and unless he's somewhere else in this building, uh, it doesn't appear that we have an ally in Cardinal Hollers today. Y uh, como él había dicho, dicho que había uh, olvidado la copia suya de, de la registración del Cerro Tolerancia en casa en Luxemburgo, uh, le uh, imprimimos un, una versión nueva y le trajimos um, esa copia hacia su, uh, su uh, hacia el lugar donde él está uh, en estos días aquí en Roma, la, es la curia de los jesuitas y pasamos uh, junto con una uh, letra um, personal a él, esa copia um, en la puerta de la, de la curia uh, romana del de, de orden jesuita. Y en la carta que, que hemos escrito le uh, preguntamos si él no podría uh, ayudar a proponer esa, esa legislación al público y le invitamos a que venga hoy día aquí a demostrar su solidaridad con los sobrevivientes de abuso sexual. Aparentemente eh, no ha llegado el cardenal hoy día. Close with this. Uh, before Eka came here for a general assembly, we had talked a bit about the story of the Good Samaritan. And I can't help but to be reminded of it in our conversation with Cardinal Hollers because the story mentions how you know, there's someone who's beaten and needs help on the side of the road, and the people who are supposed to help just pass <coughs> by. So, um, thinking, uh, uh, pensando sobre esta situación que he tratado de explicarles, um, me viene de memoria la historia del bueno samaritano en la Biblia, y que cuando gente que necesita Uh, ayudo urgentemente, le pida ayuda al, a los que pasan, uh, ellos um, no quieren ayudar porque tienen uh, importantes cosas que hacer y no tienen cómo um, actuar en el momento. Eso uh, es la impresión que tenemos sobre esa situación. So, so we want, but, but, yeah, yeah, we okay. want, we want, uh, this is really quick, I know this is a minute, we want Cardinal Hollers to be the, the Good Samaritan. And we are, our message to anybody is if you're going to help us stop the next child from being abused, join us. You're with us. You're part of us. You're with survivors. So the Cardinal Hollers, we believe he wants to do the right thing. It's Pope Francis that is not letting him do it. He and his fellow cardinals and members of the hierarchy that want to see this change, not see another form of papacy where this happens, they need to stand up and be the Good Samaritan. So we ask him to join us. We're inviting him publicly once again uh, to be with us and to join us. We're here, we're in Rome and in Geneva. And uh, you know, we, those of us that believe, are praying for him. Uh, and the crisis that he's probably in right now, and that every Catholic should see this uh, video. You're not going to see anything like this anywhere else. When? Um, uh, uh, looking at the time, um, we come to an end uh, for today. Um, are there any questions at the moment? left over after this exhausting presentation of different angles of a, a worldwide, a global problem. Yeah. Uh, I'm Keith Mortiswood, I'm the president of the UK National Secular Society and I've made numerous uh, presentations to the UN Committee for the Rights of the Child in respect of abuse all over the world, um, which is often being well received. Um, the. Uh, And I urge other people to do that as well, because I seem to be one of the few people doing this. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, I mean, I, I have less faith than you have in, in the church's ability to be able to uh, uh, cure itself, uh, certainly within a generation. Uh, and uh, like the lawyers, uh, I, I think there must also be, or even more, pressure on civil law. Uh, and in that respect, um, something I've been fighting for and, and advocating in Geneva 
is for mandatory reporting laws um, well designed and the, the guy who is the, the, the world expert and you can google him is Professor Ben Matthews in, in Australia um, and the, the general feeling is that the best laws are ones which uh, apply to institutions and those in institutions and make them criminally liable to report. Um, so thank you. Um, for yeah. The idea of, of, of mandatory reporting is in the law uh, proposal uh, to be sent to the cardinal we proposed today. Thank you. Can I add one point? So I'm from New Zealand. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, Peter. Um, we should give the journalists uh, the opportunity um, uh, to ask uh, final questions. And then probably there will be some one-to-one -one interviews or conversations afterwards. I'm sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, Nicole, Associates. Can you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicole from Associated Press. Can you? Yeah. Nicole and Guildford Associated Press. Who have you sent the proposed law to? Are you keeping it? I mean, is Hollerich your only hope? Have you sent it to bishops' conferences? Have you sent it to the DDF? Have you, who, who are you sending it to? Um, we have sent it um, on several ways uh, to the to the Pope, and we try to uh, find uh, people near to him uh, to give it him personally. Um, so, of course, we uh, we have uh, also uh, used other contacts. As an example, Hans Solner, uh, uh, who is in charge of the um, uh, Institute of the Gregoriana. And uh, we also asked him um, to prove it and, 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 and to see um, if, if they can agree that this would be a good proposal. Um, and we invite all the kind of lawyers um, to have a look on the, on the proposal. It's now public. And if they have better ideas um, uh, to come forward and do it. But um, the important point that Peter and, and all um, who have been here today in this conference are trying to make is it's urgent. We cannot wait. Because the cases of Diego happened at a time when Peter Eisley was already fighting for or against child sexual abuse by priests. And uh, what he said about his own case that it would have helped if someone a generation before would have um, called out these crimes publicly, it's true today as well. It's still happening. It's not something from the, from the past. And we could talk uh, to Janet about the situation in Uganda and other African countries. Or, uh, so it's urgent. We want something to happen now. We don't want to wait for eternities. And we wait since 2019 about the zero tolerance. Um, you, those of you who have been here then, we talked the same uh, issues uh, five years ago, and uh, we are still waiting. Under under church law right now, you can rape a child, be a priest, and stay a priest, and in ministry. That's the problem. As for the DDF, we have absolutely, and no one should, have any confidence whatsoever in that office. Yeah. He just put into that office a man who has a demonstrated history of covering up child rape and abuse. That's who he, Pope Francis, puts in charge of the office to handle abuse investigations. No confidence whatsoever. When he fires the man and puts somebody in there, who should be a layperson? It should not be a priest, it should be a layperson. Then we'll have some confidence. Victims, Catholics, no confidence whatsoever in that office. Well, what happened this week is incredibly important. One, it's about Fernandez. These are the two most important uh, individuals, two most important cardinals in the Catholic Church right now. The two most important. One, who's going to be handling all the abuse cases. Two, the man who's going to be running the synod. And, and that's why we're back 10 years. We, we, have, we have easily went back 10 years on this issue this week. Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm Vise Admelini from Reuters. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, so did the Cardinal Hollerick say that he did not convey that 
proposal to the Pope as he had promised. He did not. Yeah. He did not. He did not. And he, he proposed to do it in December. Okay. He, he did say at the end, and um, if you, in the press packet, there's a QR code, and you can watch the video for yourself. He says, you know, when we implore him to give it to him, I'll give it to him, but it won't be as effective as, like, if he had given it to him. Apparently, he is waiting for a personal audience, so he can uh, give it to him in person. But you so said that he, he had an audience with the Pope on exactly. September 18th. Exactly. Right? Yes. Exactly. I mean, so if he, he does saw. it now, if he d yeah, uh, then maybe it will disappear, or he, or he will not read it, or <coughs> we don't know yeah. the reasons why. We saw we saw Father Martin when we delivered the letter, to the American priest, and we we asked him make sure he gets this. He's like, no, he's going to get it. But he just saw the Pope that day. <coughs> okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, but it's not over until it's over. Our friend Francesco has the final word, but a short one, please. Nella fretta prima mi sono dimenticato di dire che questo report, perché appunto poi vi darò. Domani sarà depositato come allegato alle Nazioni Unite, domani saremo a Ginevra presso il Comitato eh, per i diritti dell'infanzia, dove la Chiesa non ha aderito alla Convenzione ONU per i diritti dell'infanzia, ma lì abbiamo depositato già il report contro lo Stato italiano e questo allegato va ad aggravare quel report, cioè va a dimostrare per quello che è separato in questo report non si parla di Stato, si parla solo della Chiesa e questo deposito sono le prove in pratica che andranno a gravare il favoreggiamento alla pedofilia del governo italiano e della magistratura italiana. Ecco, questo è, è quello che mi sono dimenticato prima di dire nella fretta. Thank you so much Francesco and, and he reminds me a very important uh, issue. Tomorrow a delegation of ECA is traveling to Geneva and they will hand over to the Committee for the uh, Rights of the Children the documentation also including Italy um, about uh, child sexual abuse and the uh, uh, failure of acting of the Catholic Church. So uh, we are not waiting for the Vatican to act. We are following the path of justice using all the instruments, the civil law, the international law, the human rights laws uh, give us uh, to put pressure on the Vatican to act. Thank you so much for your attention and your patience. And here we are for individual requests of uh, interviews or whatever. Thank you. Thank you.